It's been just over two months since Starfield released, and by God, is it a time sink. Todd Howard's latest creation promises the sun, the moon, all of Tamriel, and of course that it should just work. However, is that the case? Join me as we take a preliminary dive into Starfield and answer the question, is Starfield worth 90 Canadian dollars? Or 70 if you're in the US. First, let's go over why this is more of a preliminary review. Normally, I don't like reviewing games until I fully experience them so that I don't miss something or give unfair criticism. However, I'm 30 hours into Starfield, I've barely scratched the surface of that game, and between that and me being a university student in midterm season, a full playthrough of Starfield could take years. <laughs> So with that in mind, this review is going to be based on my playthrough to date. And when I fully explored the game, I'm going to do a retrospective type video. So with, I won't be talking about any part of the game that I haven't played. At the time of recording, this includes main quest, any kind of faction quest other than the Crimson Fleet, and to an extent, planetary exploration. More on that later. The gameplay for this review was collected on the Steam Deck, so my review will pertain to the PC version of the game, in particular how it performs on the Steam Deck. I'm just going to go over a quick change log to the review rubric. If you don't know what that is, it's a review I, a rubric I created to review games with so I can be as fair as possible. I went over it more in depth in my Tears of the Kingdom review, so if you want to know more about it, I'd recommend watching that. And if you don't care about the game, the, cha the change log, you can skip to the time on your screen for a talk on the gameplay loop now. Still here? Okay, here's a quick change log to the rubric. Put it up on the screen right now. It's a quick update located in the price category. I've updated the rubric to be percentage based rather than dollar based. This allows for all games to be judged regardless of price as games less than $15 Canadian could not get a score of less than 2 out of 5 on the rubric. Tears of the Kingdom would still be at a 5 in this regard, so it will not affect the score in that video, but I, I felt for the interest of transparency that I would put it there. Let's talk about the gameplay loop. Our first topic is on the gameplay loop, and I have to say, I enjoy what Starfield does so far, but there are definitely some changes I would make if it was me developing the game. Let's start with combat. <clears throat> Overall, I'm very much enjoying the combat in this game. You have a choice between either having a firefight with your enemies and in or engaging them in physical combat. I find the physical combat to be alright in a pinch, but it's definitely not as good as, going as having a firefight. You can sneak around and surprise your opponents, or you can go in guns blazing with straight up aggression. Personally, I use a mixture of those strategies and using, of course, use obstacles to hide behind while firing at my opponents, which mostly works. There's also canisters you can fire at if an enemy is near, which will deal damage to them when they explode, which is really fun. Once you win, you can loot your enemies and get gut ammo guns, suits, and among other things. So far, you actually get so much ammo from this that I've never actually had to buy ammo. And as long as you have a gun with a decently high accuracy, you'll be fine. It's the same kind of experience that I had with Skyrim as well, since I never had to buy arrows for my bows, like, ever. And for the interest of full transparency, this is the second Bethesda game I played. I will freely admit to having never played a Fallout game. I'm told the combat is similar to Fallout, but, we'll see. I do have Fallout 4, I did buy it, so maybe when I play through it, I'll, in a couple years, it'll be updated. The other thing that isn't in Fallout is combat in zero-G environments, which I felt was very well done. It's just like regular combat, but you have to worry about a third dimension, which makes targeting more of a challenge, and I think far more fun and interesting. So far, I've only encountered one of these types of zero-G combat situations, but... I hope that I do encounter more since it is a lot of fun. It adds an extra layer of challenge and complexity, which can really revitalize the combat if you've been doing it for a while. Lastly, we have ship-to-ship -ship combat, which of course, if you're building or flying ships in Starfield, you're probably had experience with. 
This is probably the part of the combat that I was most excited about, and I think overall it ends up being a bit of a mixed bag, unfortunately. On the one hand, I think firing at a ship, targeting specific systems, firing on them, disabling engines, and then docking with a ship while in combat, killing its crew, and stealing the ship for yourself is quite fun, but I also think it could have been a lot more. You're only allowed to have three distinct weapons on your ship, and I do feel a bit limited by that. I would have loved to be able to have a ship with like 9 or 10 weapons fully powered up, blow enemy ships to smithereens, but I can only have 3 per ship. 3 distinct weapon types, to be fair. You can have duplicates, but it just doesn't feel like enough for me. It feels like this game had a goal of saying yes to the player wherever possible, but the ships feel limited by arbitrary stuff that annoy ends up annoying me more than it does anything else. Which brings me to the ship mechanics themselves, and it ends up leaving me more confused. I feel like there were multiple teams involved in designing ship mechanics. One side wanted to say yes to everything, and the other side really wanted to impose limits. So they kind of met in the middle, and it ends up not quite working. You can build a ship as crazy as you want, from the Millennium Falcon to the Starship Enterprise. But it can only have one reactor and six engines, among other limits. So there is very much a realistic limit to what you can do if you want to build a general purpose ship, which I usually do. I really wish there wasn't a limit on what you could build. I feel like you'd be, you could see so much more interesting stuff and build so much more interesting stuff. This limitation it feels like a technical limitation, which would have made sense in something like 2012, back when the technology simply wouldn't have been there. But it's not 2012. If I want to build a ship made purely out of reactors with enough weapons to down a, use, a United Colonies warship in one go, I should be able to have that. I should also get have access to all possible ship halves and possible modifications at any port I stop at, but I don't have that either. I, I get why this is the case. After all, Bethesda does want you to explore their world. However, I shouldn't have to go to Neon to get parts I should could have should have been able to get in New Atlantis. It adds time to the building process and ends up annoying me more than it does anything else. The pre-built ships that you can buy at the various ports also aren't nearly as good as what you can build yourself, so it makes them more of a source of inspiration than anything else. Overall, however, I do find shipbuilding fun. I have personally spent hours in shipbuilding carefully designing and perfecting my ship, but I do wish there weren't so many limits on what I could do. I can't even fully power my weapon systems at the moment, because I don't have the reactor power to make that happen, which I could have if I was allowed to have, like, two reactors. So let me be happy. Let me have so much firepower I can single-handedly take on the United Colonies. You can also hire crews to go on the ship, but I haven't really figured out what they're for yet, other than as a posse to take with you on exploration. While we're on the topic of ships, we should probably also talk about the fact that stealing and selling ships is borderline unprofitable. The, the problem really stems from the registration costs, which are way too high to justify stealing ships for profits. In my view, 30 some hours in, the best course of action is probably to steal a ship register it, and then use it as the basis to build your own ship. Like You make more money from looting the bodies on the ship than you do from selling said ship, which really isn't the way it should be. Registration should be at most 10% of a ship's value, but instead it's like almost all of it. Vendors are also way too cheap when it comes to selling items, so it takes more time to acquire wealth than it probably should. But that's okay, depending on the perks you choose at the character builder. Personally, I went with Dream House, Adoring Fan, and Empath, so I needed a lot of money to pay off my Dream House early. Again, you don't necessarily have to pay it off all the way. You could either foreclose, which gets rid of that benefit, or you could just do a weekly mortgage payment, which, if you do the math on it, probably is better to do the mortgage payment weekly. But it's I would rather own it, so I just bought it. Um, however, once you, again, once you adapt to how the in-game economy kind of works, 
is not so bad. I have noticed, however, that I've only ever sold things at shops and not bought anything. Unless, of course, you want to count the shipyards as being stores. So, I do think maybe that does need a little bit of tweaking. The next thing I want to talk about is the lockpicking system, which is probably the worst of its kind I've seen. Each level of lock has new complexities, and which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you remember Skyrim, you had to get more and more precise with the lock as time went on. But each attempt, successful or not, uses up a digit pick, which is kind of like the lock picking equivalent for a Starfield. And I really don't think you should lose a digit pick if a lock pick attempt is successful. I also encountered multiple puzzles where I'm pretty sure there was just no solution and eventually just gave up on lockpicking. Like, I really wish this mechanic had been given more thought and had been playtested a bit more, since I find it to be more tedious than anything else. I also think it needs to almost be made not necessarily easier, but more intuitive. Like, I should not have to be bouncing back and forth between lockpicking levels to find things. It should just be straight through. So, yeah, this overall an unfortunate mechanic, I think. Next up, let's talk about the characters that you can encounter. There are a lot of standouts as you do faction quests, and as time goes on, you can kind of get a connection with them, but you really need to engage with them a lot to be there, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I do wish they were a bit more memorable. You know, like it's <laughs> Mathis, I very much remember, because of course he went up, he, he was, went on the first, on the first mission with the Crimson Fleet. Delgado, of course, you do remember for his kind of cockiness. Um, Lieutenant Toft, of course. But they all feel kind of bland and almost generic. Which is, like, yes, it's memorable, but I think they could have done more. You know, there's no Jarl Bal Balgruff so far in Starfield, which is kind of unfortunate. Like, but other than that, not a lot much more to say. They function similarly enough to Skyrim that if you played that game, kind of know what to expect. Next up, exploration, both on and off world. When you jump to a new system using your grav drives, you have the ability to scan the planets and land on them. If you land at an outpost or something marked, there's usually some kind of quest for you to do, which can take anywhere from 15 minutes to over an hour, depending on how involved it is. That right there is why the final review is going to take years, because for me to do everything I want to do is going to be a while. However, once you've done the quest, I find there to be little incentive to actually explore the rest of the planet. There's just too much distance between points of interest for me to stay engaged that long. Maybe once I get bored and start running out of quests and all that to do, I'll start exploring the planets, but for now I tend to land, do the quest, and then leave. Which is a pity, because some of those planets are quite beautiful. There's also a thousand of them. Of what, but of those, maybe a hundred are worth visiting, the rest are labeled as barren. Which, to be fair, the game does tell you which planets are barren, but I do wish the game had maybe a hundred planets, all of which are worth exploring. Like, I get that they went with the space exploration theme that does involve gas giants and barren worlds and all of that, but from a gameplay point of view, it just kind of ruins the excitement of exploring a planet a bit. If you want to, you can set up outposts on planets to mine resources, hire people to work with them and set up your own kind of almost corporate <laughs> corporation type thing. But so far, I haven't really seen the point of doing that. Maybe as I get further into the game, I will, but for now, I really don't. Next up, bugs. After all, it is a Bethesda game, so did you really expect a bug-free performance from a Bethesda game? Really? No. The good news is, however, that it is, for a Bethesda game, relatively bug-free. In 30 hours, I've encountered exactly two bugs that affected my playthrough. One of which was a bug that killed someone I was supposed to kill. So, okay, fine, I'll take the completed quest. And the other more annoying one that is one that prevents me from talking to NPCs unless I kind of like keep clicking. It's intermittent, but it does. But when it does happen, it is annoying. Other than that, NPCs sometimes face away from you during a conversation, which isn't game breaking, but it is a bit jarring. We'll see what else I encounter, but so far, for a Bethesda game, it could have been much worse. Finally, 
let's talk about how to fix all of these various issues first with the lock picking system or anything else. Mods. Mods. So far, I've had to install a mod that makes lock picking much easier, so it, that makes that mechanic bearable, and a mod that gives all modules at a shipyard for every shipyard, and another mod I'll talk about later. These mods have actually made the game a lot more enjoyable for me, and I'll be leaving a link to them in the description so you can download a mod your game as well if you want to. That said, it shouldn't be up to the modding community to fix these kinds of issues in Starfield. This game came out two months ago. It shouldn't need to be modded in order to fix things. I suspect as time goes on, modders are going to keep adding to the canvas of Starfield, maybe converting one of the 900 barren planets to something else. But again, it really shouldn't be up to the community to fix Starfield. I'm now ready to give a preliminary score for Starfield's gameplay loop. Outside of some mild infuriations I have about the gameplay, it is fun. I really enjoy the gameplay so far and do hope that continues. However, there are some issues with certain mechanics and glitches and those do need to be addressed. You can fix them with mods, but this is a review of Starfield not a review of Starfield and the community's ability to fix things that should never have needed to be fixed in the first place. With that in mind, I score Starfield at a 3.5 out of 5. The gameplay is sufficient in most aspects, but in my, and in my experience there's only one real glitch that takes away from everything, but because it's only sufficient, I am going to have to give it that 3.5. However, once I've installed the mods, that rises to a 4.5 out of 5, with, with the gameplay becoming very fun, but the glitches remaining. Now, let's move on to graphics and frame rate. First off, to reiterate, I am playing Starfield on the Steam Deck, so this review will be keeping that in mind. But with all that said, Vanilla Starfield is rough. I could not get a stable 30 frames per second on 720p low with FSR2 enabled. Especially in New Atlantis, something in that area is going hard is tanking things. NPCs look rough sometimes, having an uncanny valley appearance, almost. The rest of the game, however, does look great visually, even at 720p low. So I just think some more work needs to go into the NPCs. Valve, of course, has declared Starfield as unsupported on the Steam Deck, and I am inclined to agree with that analysis, as it just cannot run properly in vanilla. Sorry, Todd, your game isn't optimized properly, but I and I did technically upgrade my Steam Deck. It's undervolted by 30 millivolts on the on all counts, CPU, GPU, SOC, overclocked to 4.1 gigahertz on the CPU, 2.2 gigahertz on the GPU, and the TDP has been set to 18 watts, as well as having Cryo Utilities 2 installed. Shoutouts to Cryobyte for being a godsend for the Steam Deck community. I'll leave a link to his channel so you can check him out there too if you haven't already and are interested. I'm also running it on the deck's internal SSD, so all should be well there. There just also seem finally there seems to be some kind of memory leak. Because I keep seeing RAM utilization rise as time as my play sessions increase, and needing more and more of that swap file which slows down loading times a lot. So usually every two to three hours, I will no start noticing it and it will get really bad around four to five hours in. So I would need to end up restarting the game. Luckily my play sessions don't go for that long usually, but when they do, you definitely notice it. Then I discovered the Steam Deck Essentials mod. This mod optimizes RAM and VRAM uses and improves frame rates across the board. Once I installed the mod with the Ultra Performance setup, I was able to run Starfield at a stable 1080p low 30fps on the Steam Deck. However, this performance did involve my overclocks getting used, so your mileage may vary. Further testing reveals that I could probably go to 1080p medium at 30 frames per second, or do 1080p low at 40, depending. Once again, this is with overclocks and undervolts involved, so your mileage may vary. I do recommend installing this mod if you're playing on the Steam Deck, so again, I'm, I'll leave a link to that in the description. But again, we get to this point, and it should not fall to modders to fix Bethesda's game. I really appreciate everything that modders have done so far for Starfield, since they're making this game, the game far more enjoyable for me. But they shouldn't have to do that. It should not fall to modders to, to make the game 
enjoyable. It should be enjoyable by itself. If modders can make the game run at 1080p, 30fps on the Steam Deck, there's no reason Bethesda themselves can't make that happen either. Or maybe even beyond that. And this isn't to diss the modders. They're more technically capable than I will ever be. But it is to show that work on Starfield needs to continue from the development team and not from the modding community. With the Essentials mod, the graphics do take a small hit, but not enough for me to notice. The creator of the Essentials mod and all the other mods I did talk about did do an absolutely excellent job. And I really hope they continue to work on their mods to see what all they can get out of the deck. But once again, it should not fall to the modding community to make this game playable at a decent, gra a decent graphical fidelities and, gra and frame rates on the Steam Deck or just in general. Once again, I'm ready to give a score. Outside of the NPCs, the game does look great, but the performance is less than what I would expect to see for the Steam Deck, especially keeping in mind the Ascensions mod. Seriously, if Cyberpunk can look as good as it does on the Steam Deck, there's no reason this can't run as can't look that good too. With that in mind, I give Star Vanilla Starfield a score of two and a half out of five. The performance is semi-stable, but not completely stable and the graphics do look good enough, I think, to justify it. However, if you include the Essentials mod, the score rises to a 4 out of 5. And lastly, we have Price. Starfield costs $90 Canadian or $70 in the US if you buy it directly from Steam. However, I was able to pre-order the game on Fanatical for 17% off, or around $74 bucks Canadian, which as of the time of recording, is still on. And I think this is about the right price for the game in this state since you do have to mod it to have the best experience on the Steam Deck. So if you only want to shop on Steam and not third party sites, I'd recommend waiting for a sale of 15% off or more before pulling the trigger on it. However, if you're really into Bethesda games or space exploration games, something like that, and you're aware that it is a Bethesda game in the first two months of its life, there is so much content in Starfield that on quantity alone, it is probably worth it for you. I therefore award it a score of 3.5 out of 5, as the game in its current state is not worth the MSRP, in my opinion, unless you are a huge Bethesda fan or like this sort of game. With that, we get to my conclusions. Overall, Vanilla Starfield has a score of 13 out of 20, and Modded Starfield a score of 17.5 out of 20. Of course, these scores are preliminary and may go up or down in the retrospective that will come out once I've done everything that I want to. This game has a lot of potential for future DLC that I hope Bethesda does expand on, and a lot of modding potential that I look forward to seeing. After all, modding is as much a part of a Bethesda game as the vanilla game is at this point. So if you want to have that kind of blended score, it'd be 15.25 out of 20. Not a bad score by any means, that's still over 75%, but it's definitely not as high as it could be. I suspect that with the right polish, Starfield Vanilla could rise to an 18 or a 19 out of 20. Or it'll do it by itself anyway as I play through it. As of right now, however, this is how I feel about the game. So we'll see how that changes as time goes on. Thanks for watching this review. If you do like the review, like the video and subscribe for future reviews. And if you feel I did Starfield dirty, leave a comment explaining why. I'm always happy to update my views as more information becomes available. Other than that, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.